And uh, do turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, begin to read verse 6, and this is found on page 1183. As this morning we continue this marvelous, uh, enlightening, and uh, encouraging letter of the Apostle Paul. He writes, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them by the cross. And this is the word of the Lord. Dear Lord, we do indeed look forward to that day when we shall see the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we will behold that glorious, most wonderful face forever with gratitude in our hearts, so overwhelming and overflowing in praise and thanks to you. And we pray that we may have a glimpse of that same faith today, Lord, as we turn to your word, and again, that this will result in true, genuine praise and worship for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, please do be seated. Do turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, and you'll also probably find it helpful to have the uh, sermon outline as well, which gives the main points of where we're uh, traveling this morning. Now, the late American actor Paul Newman, who had been married to his actress wife Joanna Woodward for over 50 years, was once asked in an interview how he managed to resist what must have been the many, many temptations he had to play around with other women. And his answer was most telling. He famously replied, why fool around with hamburger when you have steak at home? Now, it's my dear wife's birthday today, and I can assure you that had, had I said to her this morning, happy birthday, dear, you're my steak, uh, that would not have gone down terribly well. Okay, I'd be going down to the chip shop for my Sunday lunch, I'm sure. But, but I'm sure you can, you can see the point of what he's saying there. He appreciated what he did have, and so he was able to resist the temptation for something he didn't have, which would have been inferior anyway. Now, in the passage we're looking at this morning in Colossians, Paul wants to ensure that Christians don't make that kind of mistake when it comes to their faith. And he does so by getting believers to appreciate what they do have so that they're not lured away by folk offering them things they think they don't have. You see, what other people offer is spiritual hamburger, even if it has a sort of Christian sauce smeared on the top, compared to the Lord Jesus Christ who is steak. So according to the Apostle Paul, what are we to do if we're going to keep on keeping on in the Christian life and not be sidetracked? First of all, he says, move on by staying put. Verses 6 to 7. Now, now in verse 5, Paul has said that he's delighted to see how firm in the faith these Christians really are. But he doesn't take that for granted, that they, or indeed we, will stay that way. And writes, so then, 
Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Now, the first base in the Christian life is receiving Christ Jesus as Lord. That is recognizing who he is and what he came to do, things which Paul will elaborate on a few verses later. But, you know, some people don't reach this first base. And so they wonder why their lives don't seem to change, why they appear to have the same values and attitudes as everyone else, why the, the, there's never seems to enjoy contentment, even though they attend church quite regularly and they try to do their best. Now, if the truth be known, that may be you here this morning. Oh, you're acquainted with the Christian faith, but you're not committed to the Christian faith. You have an admiration for Christ, but you do not have a conviction about Christ. In short, you have not yet received Christ Jesus as your Lord. You see, unless a seed is planted, it can't grow. And unless the seed of the gospel has been planted in your own heart, then Christian fruit is not going to be forthcoming. How can it? You may have been associated with this church for years, or only a matter of months. It doesn't matter. What God is calling you to do this morning is to surrender your lives wholeheartedly to the Lord Jesus Christ. To stop dilly-dallying, because the opportunity may not come again. And that is God's word to you this morning. But once you have received Christ into your hearts, then what? Paul tells us, stay put. Now, there are, two, uh, there are four pictures Paul uses to illustrate this. The first is the picture of a tree whose roots go deep down into the soil so that they can grow strong and tall. So let me ask, is that a, a good picture of you? Are your roots going down deep into God? Or are they just sort of remaining there under the surface? Even a small bush or a sapling may grow strong in a hard and precarious place if its roots curl around rocks and, and push into the soil. And so it is that God's promises in Scripture may be the rocks that hold and protect you. And his covenanted love, the soil that will feed you and will grow you. The second picture is of a building being raised on a foundation. Built up in him. So here's the second question. Is your Christian life a developing one? Are you building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Not simply staying in the safe confines of your comfort zone, but taking risks for him. Opening conversations, gospel conversations, helping people, maybe striking out on a new career in Christian service at home or abroad. Or is it the case that your house of your faith is still at the same level as it was five years ago? a year ago, with hardly any more bricks being put in place. Well, God says here through his apostle, keep on building. Don't stay. Build up. Now, the third image is a very interesting one, and it's that of a legal document, which establishes something beyond dispute. Now, the translation we have here in, in our Bibles is strengthened in the faith as you were taught. But the word strengthened may be better translated established, as a legal document is confirmed and ratified by both parties. So the thing is this, when you're tempted to drift spiritually, remember the covenant that God has established with you, signed by God's hand, not in ink, but dipped into the sacrificial blood 
of Jesus, his son. That is how committed he is to you. Now, when you think about it, those three pictures speak of permanence. A tree stays where it's planted, a building where it is founded, a legal document doesn't have a sell-by date. And so it is for the Christian. You do not move on from the gospel message about the Lord Jesus Christ that you were first taught. Oh, yes, you go deeper into it, but you do not move away from it. Now, a few weeks ago, as a staff team, uh, we watched a lecture uh, given by a youthful Professor D.A. Carson, given back in 1988. This year, he turned 70. Now, one of the things uh, that some of us remarked upon was the admiration we felt for him that over all the many, many years that he's been writing and speaking, this man, who has a brain the size of a small planet, has not moved one inch from his biblical evangelical convictions. Not a single inch. He's certainly grown in them. He certainly had them deepened. But whereas some of his contemporaries have moved on from what they consider to be a rather infantile spiritual state, someone who takes the Bible seriously, he's remained true. And that is such an encouragement. But this has not just happened. It has taken a single-minded devotion involving prayer, attending God's word, meeting with God's people, and especially keeping close to the cross so that he's remained humble and dependent. In other words, all the things that Paul reminds us of here. But there is a fourth picture in verse 7. Overflowing, he says, with thankfulness. Now here's the image of a goblet of, of wine at a festival. It's full, it's, it's overflowing. So you get the idea, at a, perhaps at a wedding, you know, the cork is popped out of the bottle and out gushes the champagne, cascading over the glasses as they're filled. And this overflowing of thankfulness is not just a sort of buzz of a good feeling, because feelings come and go. It is the growing recognition of the extent of God's goodness and saving grace in our lives and the response of gratitude and love. Now, you keep on being like that, says Paul, and you will remain faithful. But of course, life is never that simple, is it? There's always someone who wants to come in and ruin things. Hence the second point. Keep safe by keeping watch, verses 8 and following. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Now, surely one of the most terrifying experiences that anyone could have would be to be uh, taken captive kidnapped, held hostage. Uh, some of you may have seen the Taken movies with Liam Neeson, ex-CIA operative, who in the first film has to suffer the kidnap of his daughter, in the subsequent movies the kidnap of his wife, and indeed even himself, some CIA operative he is, but there we are. But what comes through in the movies, and even when you read, um, say, Terry Waite's account of his ordeal, is the sheer disorientating effect and the sense of uncertainty and fear which surrounds these people, and the ordeal is simply crippling. Now, that is what Paul doesn't want Christians to experience, according to verse 8. He doesn't want them to be taken away from the gospel and, 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 and imprisoned by something else. So how might such a spiritual kidnapping happen? Well, Paul says, by empty philosophy. Now, I'm sure some of you have come across the definition of a philosopher. 
someone who takes that which everyone can understand and turns it into that which no one can understand, okay? That's not what he's talking about. He's not referring here to an academic discipline. In fact, it's a word which can refer to any teaching or any religion which does not have Christ at its heart, as we see at the end of verse 8, rather than on Christ. It's all to do with human tradition. It's something which is fabricated by human beings, the mere human mind. So no matter how valuable, no matter how impressive something might appear, no matter how many other people are swayed by it, if Christ, and I mean Christ of the Bible, is not at the center, it is of little ultimate value. In fact, it is hollow. It is deceptive. It is man-made. It's simply concerned with the things of this world. Now, in comparison to what we have in Jesus, such teaching is little like those little wooden or plastic blocks which children have upon which are written the basic letters of the alphabet, which may be behind the word translated elemental spiritual forces. It literally is the elementals, the ABCs. That's all they are. And the way this enticement can happen may be rather subtle. For many years, Dr. Paul Herbert labored as a missionary in India before returning back to the United States to teach theological students. Now, speaking of his own denominational background, which happened to be Mennonite, he made a very important observation. He said one generation of Mennonites believed the gospel and held there were certain social, economic, and political entailments, things which flowed from the gospel. People like Wilberforce saw that in relation to slavery. The next generation, he said, assumed the gospel and began to focus on the entailments. The third generation denied the gospel. And the entailments, politics, social concern, and so on, were everything. Now, that is how the drift takes place. It's not deliberate. It happens with individuals, it happens with churches, it happens with denominations like ours. And it is absolutely vital, you see, that the gospel is central. And your, part of your responsibility as a congregation is to make sure that we ministers do that. Don't take it for granted that we will. Keep us on the ball. In other words, why go for hamburger when you can have steak? And what steak? Which Paul is about to describe to get our juices going. Now, in verses 9 to 10, Paul underscores the supremacy of Christ, which he's begun to unfold in chapter 1, verses 1 to 15. And, uh, sorry, in chapter 1, verses 15 and following, that great hymn which uh, Scott spoke about a few weeks ago. But here, he focuses on three things. God in Christ, you in Christ, and Christ over all. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. There is God in Christ, where all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. Now, this is the exact opposite of an abstraction. This is concrete. God as a human. As someone said, Jesus is God's personal and eternal word, made personal and historical. And we really must grasp this because everything depends upon it. So that all that Jesus says, all that Jesus does, all that Jesus is reveals God. He's not just part of God. 
He's not just a spokesman for God. He's not even a great prophet of God as the Muslims believe. He is God. The fullness of deity with true humanity embodied here in this Galilean Jew. So we're not left to our imaginations wondering what God might or might not approve of. What kind of life is truly flourishing for human beings. What God's character is like. Because all we've got to do is to turn to Jesus for the complete and final answer to those kinds of questions. And the apostles is inspired. And it's only realizing this and cherishing this that will stop us from being enticed away from Jesus onto other things. I do love this piece of advice from the Scottish preacher Robert Murray McShane. He said this, Learn much of the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely, such infinite majesty, and yet such meekness and grace, and for all sinners, even the chief. Live much in the smiles of God, bask in his beams. Feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in love and repose in his almighty arms. Let your soul be filled with a heart-ravishing sense of the sweetness and excellency of Christ and all that is in him. The whole of divinity united with complete humanity to produce this wonder of wonders, God in the flesh. So if this is God, where else do you want to go to look for him? If this is God, where where else would you go to, to look to experience him? If this is God, then which other words would you turn to to hear him? Why bother with hamburger when you've got steak? But not only that, If you are a Christian, you have fullness too. You in Christ, verse 10. And to drive the point home, Paul uses some very graphic imagery to describe some of the things that have happened to us as a result of our union with him in faith. Verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were were circumcised by Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Now what Paul's doing here is to reach back into the Old Testament to find pictures in order to impress upon us the supernatural God-given work of Jesus on the cross, of which we are the primary beneficiaries. So he talks about us being circumcised by Christ. Now, you know that for the Jews, circumcision, the cutting off of the flesh of the foreskin, was a sign that you belonged to the people of God. It was a visible mark that you were his special possession, and you were to be the recipients of his special promises. And it was no doubt a very painful practice, especially if you were an adult. But here, you see, Paul is pointing to another place where the real circumcision took place, the cross. When Jesus' flesh was cut and made bloody so that our flesh need not be. And that is how much God loves you, says Paul. So where else are you tempted to look for for some kind of reassurance that you are loved by him? You go to the cross. And similarly to when Paul speaks of his being buried with him in baptism. Verse 12 has the definite article. It is the baptism, which is how Jesus described his death in Mark chapter 10. So I don't think here he's referring to our water baptism, but Jesus' baptism, him being immersed or overwhelmed, which is what the word baptism means. It just means being drenched, drowned. 
And there on the cross, he was being drenched or drowned, if you like, by God's anger against our sin. And so that as Jesus was buried, so in a sense, we were buried with him as, as we believe in him. To go with all our sin. And then to be raised to newness of life when Jesus was raised. And that means that our guilty sin remains buried. And they're not going to be digged up by God again and used against us on the judgment day. He's finished with them. But what is more? There is Christ over all things. At the end of verse 10 and verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, of course, on the day, it looked like it was the powers and the authorities that were triumphing over him as the Roman soldiers drove the nails into his hands. But not according to Paul. No, he was rendering them ineffective. Because although they did not intend it, they were bringing about God's plan of rescue, whereby our sins are forgiven. And that whatever spiritual forces may exist in this universe, they were made subject to Jesus, who now reigns in heaven from on high. And so they cannot ultimately harm you. If Jesus is your Lord, because you're seated with him there, well protected. Now, this year, we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Great Reformation. And one person who did receive Christ Jesus as Lord and became firmly rooted and built up in him was Martin Luther. And if you want to know the difference it makes having a genuine Christian faith, and not one which relies on religious rigmarole, then listen to this prayer of Luther, which he offered just before he died. O oh, Heavenly Father, God of all comfort, I thank you that you have revealed yourself to me, your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in whom I have believed, whom I have preached and confessed, whom I have loved and praised. I pray, dear Lord Christ, let me commend my soul to you, Oh, Heavenly Father, if I leave this body and depart this life, I am certain that I will be with you forever and that I can never, never tear myself out of your hands. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And having repeated that Bible verse three times, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, the true God. Amen. Friends, why bother with hamburger? The hamburger of religion, when you can have the steak of the gospel. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your wonderful, overwhelming generosity in the Lord Jesus Christ for people like us. And Lord, when we are tempted to doubt you, when we are tempted to look for something or something else, somebody else, for that fulfillment, that fullness which only Christ can give, we pray you'd bring us back again to the same old, old story. And in it we would rejoice. In it we would take our comfort. And Lord, for every one look at ourselves, we pray we would take ten looks at Christ. For your name's sake. Amen.